Can I have your attention, please? Uh, the session was supposed to start at two. Um, we decided to, to delay it slightly, um, uh, just so that everyone can make their way in. Um, the next uh, session will be called Sectarianism and Political Islam. Um, as you know, the, the theme of sectarianism has been a mainstay of, of the Syrian conflict. Um, and so being able to discuss it in an academic setting is extremely important so that Western societies like ours can begin to understand the, the dynamics uh, of, of the region and also how the different uh, communities within Syria like relate to each other. Um, so uh, that being also, um, in, in addition to that, I wanted to say that we, when we decided to have this conference, we really wanted to place a great deal of emphasis on having open discussions as well and so we we have short discussions and then at the end we have a long question and answer session and we feel that that's probably the best way in order for everyone to learn as a group because if you're just there listening then you don't absorb as much as, as when you ask questions so please when the the speakers get up there to, to say their piece uh, write down as many questions as you want um, put your hand up and 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 we'll try and get through as many of them as possible, okay? So, the first speaker, um, the first speaker is Karim Purhamzavi, and his uh, speech, his uh, presentation will be about Trump's administration and the future of jihad, the role and future of political Islam in the region. Please welcome Karim Purhamzavi. Hello, everybody. Um, today I'm going to speak about a specific type of political Islam that I refer to as jihadi type of political Islam or briefly jihadism. So I'll talk about their background and their ideology and I'll try to be as brief as possible. And um, after that I'll make a comparison between two cases of Afghanistan in the 1980s and um, current Syria. However, um, the jihadist group um, to me that is our only uh, micro uh, subject to this paper and I would like to consider this in a larger um, structure. Uh, particularly I want to emphasize on the point that such a group historically uh, depended on external uh, support for their uh, emergence, survival and rise of their movements. Um, and by external support or sponsorship, I mean um, regional and global powers who always use this group against specific rival. Um, so, in a sense, um, I look at this things uh, systematically, and by system I mean uh, international system which dominated by a realist approach that allow production of this groups um, directly or indirectly. And if the problem is uh, systematic, then we can't rely on simply rhetoric. Well, we can't rely on Trump's rhetoric anyway, so whether the guy can say something uh, today and contradict it um, uh, next week. But uh, we can't rely on rhetoric such as we will destroy, destroy uh, ISIS or before Trump. Obama administration, which tended to degrade and destroy ISIS, or even before that, uh, Bush administration will declare a whole war on terror. So that's only rhetoric. And bear in mind, by destruction of simple group, um, we don't. That was 14th century, so 7th century after the birth of Islam in Hijaz part of Arabia. By that time, um, Islam expanded from the western part toward North Africa, um, toward Iran, India, and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in the east, and uh, Southern Europe uh, in the north. So we have a mixture of uh, initial thoughts that were very born in, uh, in Arabia and their mixture with uh, local cultures of, of other, uh, other realms. Uh, and uh, that's actually what we refer to when we say Islamic civilization. And also in the ten, ten, uh, 10th century, we have interpretation of um, ancient Greek philosophy which was incorporated into Islamic thought and that, that's by itself gave birth to uh, Islamic philosophy started from Farabi and uh, so on to in Arabi. Um, all of this were incorporated into jurisprudence of Islam. 
so, uh, as a result, uh, jurisprudence of Islam relied on rationality to interpret sacred texts. Um, like the Sunnis have the Ta'wil and uh, uh, the Shia have Batan, which both are um, similar, I think, and means like uh, they don't rely on the exact meaning, uh, exactly what the text uh, is written, but they rely on what the text actually means in different time of place. However, for Ibn Taymiyyah, all of this evolution was just bad innovations which were for, forbidden by God, the common bidah. Um, so we have this Puritanist view here. And then he suggested the best way to understand Islam is to rely on the first two generations of, of uh, Islam, people who actually lived during the time of uh, Muhammad and uh, uh, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, and uh, the, the generation that slightly was after them. Uh, I'm not going to talk about um, how controversial this is, particularly the first record, recording system emerged 300 years after the death of Muhammad. And, uh, but I'll emphasize the point that we have puritanical and then dogmatic uh, point of view here. Um, and by uh, the, the term Salafi also refer on, on that the first two generations of Islam. Uh, in Arabic and Islamic term they call it Salaf and that's why they call it known as Salaf. So Salafis uh, claim that they follow that generation and they are the pure uh, type of Muslim, while others are not. So it's, it's a very uh, exclusive uh, point of view. Also, um, the way that Ibn Taymiyyah was disagreeing with, with, with other uh, approaches and Basically, all of Sunni, uh, all of the um, Islamic schools, uh, Sunni and Shia and uh, Sufis. Uh, the way uh, he was disagreeing with them by way of takfir. Like the term communication probably is not the right uh, interpretation of takfir. But when when you read his books, you can understand he's very angry. He just calls people by by labels and demonizes them. These are sa'ibarawat and blah blah. Um, so that was his, his way of deciding with others. Uh, so we have a kind of like dehumanizing machine here. Um, and that was particularly or specifically uh, uh, directed against Shia. Uh, so uh, also it's important to notice that he gave a uh, new interpretation of jihad, very, very uh, a dangerous one. So jihad in mainstream understanding of Islam is not an uh, individual act, it's a collective. You can't simply go and stop people and say, I'm doing jihad. Uh, also, it is, um, some also notice that jihad is, is, is a defensive term, like when, when an Islamic realm is a trans uh, uh, was under attack, so it's the duty of Muslims to do jihad and defend themselves. And that's, however, have restrictions. So you have to follow the, the imam of, of the leader or whoever had the authority to declare jihad. However, for, for Ibn Taymiyyah, jihad was, was fard ayn, which means uh, it's uh, individual duties. So far, um, we just can understand that we are talking about a very unpopular approach. Why people would, would, would buy this, particularly like he, he undermined all of the uh, Islamic schools. And even that, we have to understand the, uh, understand it through the geopolitical struggle of the time. Like uh, in the 14th century, we are speaking about Mamluk versus Mongols. Mamluk were uh, rulers of Levant and uh, uh, Egypt, while Mongols were ruling Iran and uh, uh, Iraq. So, uh, and both sides used ulema as part of their propaganda and, and their, their conflict. So ulema were either mobilizing people or legitimizing and, and delegitimizing warfare and, and things like that. So Mam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was a very active uh, jurist in the, in the Mamluk camp. And uh, Mamluk fought six wars with, with Mongols, won five, and uh, they were defeated uh, uh, in, in one battle. Uh, and they were defeated by a Shia convert, uh, Mongol rulers, called Mahmud Qazan. He converted to Islam in late uh, uh, 13th century, and it was a big deal for the Mamluk. Uh, so, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was the only, uh, the only 
uh, Adam who actually uh, called that Gaza is, is not a Muslim. You know. There wasn't such a precedent uh, among uh, Muslims, even uh, uh, even Tarini Astan, uh, ulama that declared somebody who is Muslim to declare him kafir. Um, so he, he, he left a very bad precedent and uh, 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 we can talk about the legacy of, of Ibn Taymiyyah because Salafism is not a product of the 14th century, uh, although it was suggested by the 14th century. Then the first uh, Salafist movement known as Wahhabi movement emerged in mid 18th century through a preacher called Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. Muhammad Abdul Wahhab uh, learned about Ibn Taymiyyah, but he, he, he wasn't that knowledgeful like Ibn Taymiyyah. Like he didn't need to know about other Islamic approaches and he didn't even bother with that and labeled them all as kafirs. Um, again, uh, we can't, we, so, so, so Wahhabism, when we say Wahhabism, actually it's a title that refers to the founder of Wahhabi uh, movement, but the approach is itself is Salaf. Um, even Wahhabism can't be viewed as an like independent uh, movement that rose by itself. In a matter of, uh, as a matter of fact, um, the first two people who decided with Ibn Wahhab was his father and his brother. Uh, and he didn't reveal what, what he believed until his father did. And then the first person who, who was interested uh, by Ibn, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab was uh, the ruler of Uyayna. So at that time, we are speaking about Najd here, not Hijaz. The whole Arabia was under, uh, was part of the Ottoman Empire, but the Ottoman control was restricted to, to Hijaz, which is uh, the western part of uh, uh, Arabia. The vast desert of Najd was ruled by no one. We are speaking about simple towns which ruled by their own um, sheikh or the leader of the tribe and, and things like that. So one of the sheikh, Uthman bin Mamar in in uh, in Uyayna was interested about Muhammad Abdul Wahab for, for gaining power in his own small town. However, the people of Uyayna couldn't handle this. Like Abdul Abdurrahab started to break stones and graves, cut uh, uh, trees, and um, finally he stoned a woman to death. So the people were even they, they had a plan to to assassinate him. Uh, and they started to make complaint uh, uh, against him about the, uh, uh, to, to the ruler of al a very large city. So, anyway, so uh, Bin Maimar was, was forced to let Abdul Wahab go to another city and he went to that area where uh, Ibn Saud was ruling it. Then Ibn Saud was, was actually more ambitious. He, he, he was interested about ruling beyond that area. So, uh, as uh, the alliance between them, uh, Ibn Saud promised uh, Ibn uh, Abdul Wahhab to uh, perform jihad against the infidels, and Ibn Abdul Wahhab promised him the victory in Nasr. And then, uh, from that alliance until today, like Saudi is ruled by a uh, dissident of Ibn Saud in a political affairs and in a religious affairs, dissident of, of uh, uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab should take charge. Uh, of that to this date. Um, also in mid um, uh, 19th century we have the British who were interested uh, interested about the Wahhabi movement and that was mainly driven against uh, the Ottoman Empire and their, their allies in, in, in Arabia. Uh, that continued until the establish, uh, establishment of 19, uh, establishment of Saudi Arabia in 1932 as a state. And another important event which take place in the in the early 1960s, from 1962 onward, we have this propagating, propagating Wahhabism worldwide. So, and that was also part of uh, larger context, such as the Cold War, that we have to see the Saudi-US uh, alliance and how this was directed against uh, basically the, social, the socialist camp. And in regional, uh, at, at regional uh, level, that was directed against uh, uh, Arab secular nationalists such as Jamal Abdel Nasser and so on, who were, who were the opposite direction of uh, House of Saudi who ruled Saudi Arabia. Uh, 
Okay, so let's move to Afghanistan and Syria. And by Afghanistan, I mean Afghanistan in the 1980, uh, 1980s, basically. In 1979, Afghanistan was invaded by the Soviet army. And uh, in, in first few few weeks or, or, or months, if you like, um, US, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and UK hoped that there, there will be an uprising against the, uh, the, uh, the Soviets. But the few tribal resistance was not uh, satisfactory and wasn't enough. So um, these countries decided to, to intervene and uh, uh, basically turn, uh, turn Afghanistan into another Vietnam, the CIA term. Um, and um, there was already eight Islamist groups uh, in, in Pakistan with very, very few connection to, to the Afghan gra grassroots, grassroots level. And uh, uh, the jihad started since then. Um, if we rely on, on uh, uh, numbers and statistics that Ahmad Rashid gave us, uh, from 1980 to 1980, uh, 1990, uh, Ten billion dollars were spent uh, on the Afghan uh, jihad, and uh, that mostly went for for weapons against uh, against uh, uh, the Soviet Union. We speak four billion dollars from from the U.S. and four billion dollars from Saudi Arabia, which this is an official uh, uh, number or coming from the Saudi government. We are not talking about uh, uh, about the. the a religious institution, the Wahhabi institution, which they have their own giant, the giant budget and they are part of the state and part of the hegemony in, in Saudi Arabia. They were also very influential and spending a lot of money, particularly for, uh, and their money was going to the Mujahideen Bureau, Maktab uh, Kanawat Mujahideen, which means the uh, Mujahideen Bureau headed by Abdullah Azam and Bin Laden. So, um, uh, Syria, well, uh, the Syrian uprising started in 15 March 2011. Some would say that uh, the, the, the militarization of the Syrian uprising started from that month, but the uh, majority of, of resources uh, would say that by end of uh, 2011, the uprising was already militarized by different uh, tactic and, and, and fashions. One of the... Um, one of the the, the pioneers was was Qatar, and uh, which they they had uh, Gaddafi overthrown in Libya, and then uh, they started to mobilize the fighter from from there. Let me give you an example. I, I met this uh, uh, a Tunisian guy in in Germany who had relatives who went from Tunisia to to uh, Syria uh, to fight against Assad. And um, I asked him about why would, would these people do this? Um, you have very large number of Tunisians going to Syria. And he said simply, well, this is money. And when, when we speak about money, and let's take the Tunisian case, it's, uh, it's now very diff difficult and complicated. You have to only con con uh, contact the right people in Libya, and it's not difficult to go from Tunisia to Libya. And from there, you will be paid some one thousand dollar to to be per month to be transferred to Syria. In one cases, a handicap on a wheelchair past the border to join ISIS uh, from uh, Tunisia to Libya. So, um, and we, we, we don't have uh, exact number how much was spent. We can assume that that, that the Syria conflict is is much more larger. Uh, than, than what was happening in, in Afghanistan. But uh, here and there we can see, see number. For instance, one report tells us that uh, uh, 1.2 billion was spent on, on, milita uh, on, on weapons supplied from some eight uh, uh, Central and Eastern European uh, countries uh, to 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 uh, to send weapons to Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Jordan, and then uh, the weapon is, is being ch ch uh, channeled to uh, Syria. Um, also, like Haytham Manna, one of the uh, Syrian uh, peaceful uh, position mentioned, 
uh, $3 billion suggested to Maad al Khatib, the head of the Syrian opposition in Turkey, just to not negotiate with the government when the opposition decided to negotiate with, with, uh, with um, uh, Assad regime in, in Geneva, to Geneva talk. Um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar suggested this $3 billion for the Syrian opposition to avoid negotiation in Geneva talk. So people usually, when, when they talk about, um, uh, about support to, to jihad, mujahideen, whatever you call it, uh, they only focus on, on weapons, money, and fighters. But when we talk about systematic involvement, it's much more complex than this. I hear uh, uh, the case of media. So here, this is in the 1980s, we have uh, you have a, a seminar of jihad, as the banner says, behind uh, this highly uh, high officials in Saudi Arabia, and this, this seminar or conference was was held in the 80s in, in in Saudi Arabia, and the whole organization which was uh, in charge of uh, supporting the jihad in Afghanistan was called by the current king uh, Salman, and as you can see in the uh, picture, the former Saudi King Abdullah is also one of the chairs there. Um, but this is 1980s, uh, and the media is very humble compared to nowadays tactics and techniques in, in media. And of course, you can see that Rambo is there to save uh, the Afghanis. <laughs> and here um, is the strategic Stinger missile uh, uh, who. Uh, uh, Tom Hanks called it. Um, and also in Syria we have this Tau, like the, the anti-Assad camp uh, transferred Tau missiles to the opposition to, and that was labeled uh, as, uh, uh, or called as, as a strategic weapon. Um, well, it did a lot of damage to the Syrian army, particularly it is a very sophisticated uh, anti-tank missile, but it didn't pro prevent them from gaining the advance against the opposition. Um, here is, is the area, is, uh, is a very underdeveloped area, uh, particularly in Western world. And I'm speaking about these giant media within the Middle East, speaking Arabic and other languages within the Middle East. However, we can also see the Middle East uh, eye here in the right side hand. And some, some people in the, in the Middle Eastern studies rely on this institution as a reference. And um, when, when the Syrian army was gaining advance in eastern uh, Halab, they had nothing to do or, or they ran out to the sources, so they, they relied on a, a Nusra uh, propagandist and introduced him as, um, um, as uh, the last western uh, journalist in Aleppo or something like that. And yeah, so the whole campaign of the last day started, uh, we are getting cured, this is the last day, and if you don't hear our messages, please forgive, forgive us or something like this, you complete the jihad. None of them was there. All of them went to either Turkey or, or uh, 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 Idlib. Well, none of these people who, who were actually holding the, camp, uh, the campaign were, uh, was there that um, I don't have time to give all of the, the tactics used here, uh, but let me call, uh, let me uh, briefly talk about the, the photo in Middle. This is from Orient uh, Saudi uh, channel. And by the way, um, in the previous uh, slide, it was in the 1980s. So we have uh, to also bear in mind that the Saudi media empire started from, or building that empire started from 1990s. Some would say more than 50% of the media in the entire Arab world uh, owned by Saudi Arabia, and after that you have uh, Qatar, and nowadays the involvement of of uh, uh, Emirat to also have a share of media. Uh, so let's talk about this Orient here, and and how this media actually uh, turned as a uh, as a media platform for the for, for even ISIS. So ISIS was fighting on the ground, and the Arab media. Uh, <coughs> Uh, was actually directly or indirectly making propaganda for them. Uh, one of the tactics is just to bring any, any excuse, and the excuses are very poorly made. For instance, here in, in audience, uh, this anchor lady, after a few seconds, like she all of a sudden say, oh, another action movie from ISIS. 
and you as an audience would say, oh, maybe this is a, a, a joke or, or a comedy, the way it was introduced. And also the time is a few weeks before the fall of Mossad. So by this excuse, they show you the entire movie produced by ISIS and ISIS uh, military, uh, ISIS fighters um, surrounding uh, uh, an Iraqi uh, military base in the, in the, in the uh, border and massacring them one after one, and, and you get, get shocked while we do that. Another tactic here, I have an Al Jazeera uh, example here. For instance, when there is a message by, by ISIS uh, uh, leader, uh, they broadcast it worldwide. Like uh, Al Jazeera had 300 million audiences up to 2003, so you can imagine how, how, uh, how far they can go with, with this. Uh, Things. And also in, in, in Western media, we, we only focus on uh, social media, uh, uh, such as YouTube and, and, and something else. But, but uh, ISIS uh, and, and this jihadist uh, product, media production is actually backed by, by uh, gigantic uh, media within the Middle East. And uh, this is a photo from Al Wasabi. It's, it's a very uh, very actually um, puritanist. Um, uh, it's it's basically basically a propagate genocide uh, genocidal uh, uh, project. Like when when you see this like uh, media, they say okay, just uh, Shia are not human. You have to kill them. Sufis are not human, and, and blah blah blah. So all minorities are not human, and actually the jihadists are applying these things on the ground. Uh, there. Here we have another example of Sheikh Arur. Uh, he's a, Sy a Syrian Salafist. By 2012, he appeared in Saudi Arabia. He was given this uh, media outlet. And uh, in, in his uh, TV channel, in this episode, he appears as, uh, as a commander, actually. As you can see, he has a Syrian map and ordered uh, the, the, the fighter to go there, go here, and, and do this, kill this, kill that. Um, but I, I want to use this example to highlight the notion of donors. Usually when, when they say, okay, donors pay money to these jihadists, we think donors are just act, act of individuals. As a, as a matter of fact, it is this part of the state. For, for instance, um, uh, this guy who has, has a TV channel in Saudi Arabia, he has his own uh, uh, bank account number and his followers just put in his... Uh, his even cell phone number, his bank account number, and asking other uh, people to support the jihad in in, uh, in Syria. And as we can see from the code, it starts from SA, and the phone number belongs to Saudi Arabia. The bank is in, in Saudi Arabia. So I mean, is this guy act of of, of individual or or he is part of the state, uh, and therefore part of the systematic machine that? Uh, benefit the jihadists on the ground. Also, uh, this is the Egypt case. Like Egypt is a country with a population of 80 million. Shia population of Egypt are barely 18,000, so they are far less than one person. Uh, but when you see the media, all of them, uh, all of which uh, emerged in post-2011, when Saudi Arabia gained influence that you can see this army of media against Shia, as if the Shia is, is, is uh, the uh, um, uh, problem number one in, in Egypt. Um, and, and that's actually part of, uh, part of Saudi doing things. Uh, in, in, in uh, their foreign affairs. Uh, for instance, when they have problem with the, with the Iranian government, they declare war against the whole Shia, as if like, the Iranian government represents the whole Shia. And, and as, a, as someone who was born and raised in Iran, I, I can tell you about my first experience from the Iranian society. It is very highly uh, secularly oriented society. I'm talking about society, not the regime, which is an official bureaucracy. Uh, uh, so uh, let me skip up this this funding about how ISIS covers uh, sorry, sorry how 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 uh, um, Syria uh, how Al Jazeera Arabic covers Syria and Iraq. Uh, they are very interesting uh, funding uh, finding, which I did a journal article uh, 
last year, and it's published, you can, can go and find it if you want. Um, so again, get back, uh, let's get back to Afghanistan and Syria. In Afghanistan, the number of parties are like, um, they were parties, we have uh, US, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, the UK, some also add uh, the UAE uh, from the 1990s when, when similar camp was, was supporting uh, um, uh, Taliban to, to get in power. On the other hand, and ironically, we have Russia and Iran who did their best in the 90s to stop uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda come to power. Uh, basically, the same people are in the same camps involved in, in Syria as well. Um, uh, in Syria, we have US, France, UK, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, Jordan, the UAE. Uh, versus Assad, um, Russia, Iran, and, and Hezbollah. Also, I mean, if, if you want to put more parties, you can always do that. I mean, we are speaking about eight Central and Eastern Europe uh, states who, who, knowing their weapons, is going to go to Syria and to the, to the conflict there, but they were still happy in setting that from 2011 to at least 2016, uh, based on evidence. And there is a probability that they are st still doing this. So, lessons from Afghanistan. Well, here Hillary Clinton has a very interesting uh, um, quote about Afghanistan. She said that we, we actually created Al Qaeda there, uh, we turned Afghanistan into a mess, and we left it into its chaos, and we just left. Um, some would say, Afghanistan wasn't totally left into chaos. Some parties also were interested to make business out of the chaos itself, particularly Saudi Arabia and Iran and, uh, and Pakistan, which were interested about supporting Taliban and uh, uh, yeah, who, who, whoever was, was, was with them, mainly because of, of confronting uh, Iran in, in that context. Uh, so, uh, as, as, as we talked from, like, we started from 14th century uh, until today, all, I also skipped, like, two or three uh, historical stages, particularly the, the jihadists in the 20s in North Africa and uh, the case of Iraq. But in all cases, we have this jihadist group who always supported by external uh, uh, party. And also, the chaos and instability which results from this pro proxy war uh, benefit no one. The jihadists are very aware about this. Like if you refer to Abdullah bin Muhammad in his writing, he's a, he's a uh, jihadist ideologue. He says, um, like, Somalia is, is, is his best, uh, best model, Somalia and Afghanistan. He argued that we, we, we can't survive in a stable places. So we always want Soma uh, places like Somalia and uh, uh, Afghanistan, but unfortunately, according to him, Somalia and Afghanistan are not good enough for us. First, whatever we do there, it doesn't attract the media attention. Second, we uh, we don't have this food security for it. We, we, do, we won't have enough food, and the, 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 the pirating business is not enough for us. So that's why he suggests the Somalization of Syria and pushing toward no-fly zone and, and things like that. So they can take over Syria. So they, they are aware that they, they need highest. They are not popular enough to, to attract people heart and mind in stable uh, places. Um, then, chaos is not, uh, is not a good, good option when, when you leave uh, uh, Syria into its chaos and just leave under whatever excuse, talking <coughs> Assad and, and, and whatever, if, if Assad topples next day, we don't know what will happen to Lebanon. And um, we are talking about over 150 groups fighting even each other, not Assad. Uh, there, and we are aware the, the ideology of majority of them is, is jihadist and uh, there is no guarantee what what going to happen after Assad is gone. So the chaos doesn't help. Um, uh, uh, and this, and I, I finish my, my uh, my presentation with this is telling us something about the, how the, the world functions. 
that when you refer to the neorealist dominant neorealist approach, it doesn't tell you don't support the jihadists. As a matter of fact, they, they tell you we live in an in a anarchic world and uh, we are under consistent danger, so we have to, uh, to gain power, maximum power, and use every necessary mean to, to uh, weaken our rivals, including the using of, of, of jihadism against our rivals. So that's the dominant uh, uh, powerful perspective. And the alternative, which is the new realist approach, is not uh, applicable. Uh, well, the new liberals basically say, let's, uh, let's our few people do business with our uh, with your few people, and through doing business, this, these two groups are powerful enough to keep the peace between these two countries. I'm not sure how this is applicable to Syria, Afghanistan, and, and elsewhere. Um, but uh, eliminating such group needs a systematic reform. Like we, we can't just rely on rhetoric. We're gonna destroy ISIS, and, and uh, before that, we're gonna destroy Al Qaeda. Before that, probably we're gonna destroy I don't know Taliban, and so on. But this group were not uh, have not been destroyed or, or eliminated. As a matter of fact, they they flourished over time, and that's what I see gonna happen in in Syria if. Um, if uh, uh, if the anti-Assad camp win actually there, and this is the angle I look at the Trump administration, and I see by by the rhetoric that Trump is, is bringing, and, and their uh, the Trump admin administration agenda will only uh, 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 bring the the Middle East into more chaos, which ultimately benefits the jihadists. So I'll leave it here.